What would you classify as personal truth? Well, um, personal truth has attributes and characteristics, just like divine truth has absolute uh, has, you know, uh, characteristics and attributes. Mm -hmm. Obviously, the attributes of personal truth are very, very different to the attributes of divine truth. So let's say divine truth is God's truth or absolute in nature. Personal truth often varies from day to day. <laughs> so it has this, you know, one day I feel this way and the next day I feel that way. Like yesterday I thought that you didn't love me, today I think you do. You know, personal truth varies quite markedly and, it, and often is not correct at all. It, it is just a personal opinion. Mm -hmm. Often not backed up by facts, not backed up by logic, not by, backed up by science, not backed up by mathematics, not backed up by reality. Often it's imagination uh -huh. that we determine as personal truth. So that's one characteristic of personal truth. Personal truth is very, very different from God's truth in that God's truth is absolute, is scientific, is mathematical, is backed up by facts, is reality. <laughs> sure. And obviously the difference between the two are quite large. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when a person says, this is my truth, I go, yeah, you have no understanding yet of the difference between absolute truth and your truth. And when you hold on to your truth as hard as you do, you are often preventing yourself from discovering divine truth, God's truth, as a result. So then just to clarify, <coughs> would you say that personal truth is something that at the moment I emotionally accept to be truth? Yes. And it may be completely in error from God's perspective? And can, yeah. Or it may hold totally. parts of the truth from God's perspective. Yes. Or it may be right in harmony with God's truth. Yes. Right. So it's just something that I think is true right now. Exactly. It's just a personal opinion, right. basically. Right. It's a personal opinion, not necessarily backed up by facts, yeah. by logic, yeah. by scientific accuracy or mathematical accuracy, not backed up by our reality even. Yeah. It can be something that somebody even imagines yeah. to be true. It might, and oftentimes is, not backed up by personal experience. So in other words, oftentimes a person will say, oh, did you know over in Bali this particular thing happened? This is something that happened with my mother a few weeks ago. <laughs> over in Bali, this is the kind of thing that happened. I said to mum, have you ever been to Bali? She says, no. I said, so how do you know it happened? <laughs> like, all you're doing is you're believing the media, which often lies, like you know from my own experience that they've lied about everything. So, so why would you then believe the media is not lying or telling part truths about that particular thing? You've not been there. It's not been a part of your personal experience. So how would you know? That's one thing that's very, very different as well, is that divine truth can be experienced. Personal truth is often just an imaginary experience or something that's not even happened. It's just that something that's been given to you or said to you or implied to you that you then have made suppositions or assumptions about. So you're saying personal truth can actually come from fears within us. It can come Opinions from all sorts within of sources, us, yes. Fears within us um, or even... Uh, uh, something that's a lie from God's perspective can totally. actually um, be the start of what we yes. believe is Let, the let's, truth. Let's give a few examples of that. Mm -hmm. If you look at, uh, here, here's, here's, here's a truth that the majority, we're talking now the majority of Christians and the majority of other religious uh, forms, but let's look at the majority of Christians. There's about one and a half billion Christians on the planet. And the majority of them believe in this particular fundamental truth, right? That's not a truth at all. They believe that God is going to come and destroy the wicked. Now, that's what they hope will happen and they want to have happen. And some of them fear it happening. And some of them fear it happening. Yes. But it's not going to happen because it's not God's truth. Mm -hmm. It's only what they want to believe. They have, no, have, they have no evidence that it's going to happen. That they have no evidence that it's happened in the past, even. Mm -hmm. There is no evidence that it happens in day-to-day -day life because just as many Christians as non-Christians die. Yes. <laughs> so they have no evidence that it happens in day-to-day -day life. And yet, 
they want it to believe that it happens. Mm -hmm. So this is, an, uh, this is an example of something that a lot of people believe is a truth, and yet there is no scientific evidence to support it. There's no mathematic evidence to support it. There's no evidence in experience to support it. There's no evidence in reality to support it. There's only evidence in written matter that could have been fabricated. Mm -hmm. And even that doesn't provide very good evidence because a lot of good people died too. Yeah. So there is actually no evidence to support this fundamental belief that the 1.5 billion Christians on the planet have. There's no scientific evidence to support it. So why do they believe it? They believe it because there's emotional reasons why they wish to believe it. That's what personal truth does. What personal truth does is it has as its basis a heap of flawed emotional foundation that determines what you're willing to accept as truth and what you're will willing to reject as truth, as error. And, and in fact, a lot of the things get rejected as error that are actually true in mm -hmm. that place and a lot of things that are actually true get ignored as error in that place. And that's, that's a terrible fact about personal truth, mm. so-called personal truth. <laughs> and I, I put truth in quotation marks because it's not true. <laughs> yeah. Now, we can also see in day-to-day in -day life that we have a lot of these fundamental things going on in, in terms of day-to-day -day life. You know, the way the average parent brings up their child is fundamentally flawed because we have the evidence of that in humanity's pain. Like... Most people who become adults need some psychology, psychological help <laughs> to get over some of the fundamental flaws that have occurred in their childhood. But that parent believes that it is acting in harmony with its personal truth. Yes. So the parent is choosing to act a certain way towards its child, which later on the child grows up and feels is in error. And if the parent had any connection with divine truth, they'd easily see that it's an error but because they have an underlying experience of their own and underlying emotions they do not wish to feel, they bring up the child in a manner that is fund fundamentally flawed. Right? We see it in all sorts of aspects of our life. So I've brought up the religious aspect, the personal, family-based relationship aspect. We see it happening in the medical profession, the scientific profession, the political way walks of life. The religious areas, far more of examples can be brought up. We, we have it in the um, way in which we govern our enti entire nations. We have it in environmental aspects on the earth where all of us want to believe something, which is often not true at all. Mm -hmm. That's our personal truth. Personal truth is fundamentally flawed generally. And unless it's brought into harmony with God's truth, it mm -hmm. will remain so. So why is it fundamentally flawed at this point on the planet right now? Because it makes one big fundamental assumption, and that is that you're God. <laughs> Basically, that's the assumption that a person in personal truth or thinks they have the personal truth of something makes. Basically, what they're saying is they know better than anybody else certain things. Mm -hmm. And only God knows better than anyone else. Yeah. That's the reality. So... So once we become humble and we realise only God knows better than anyone else, we then start to see that wherever we're at personally, we are in progress. We're in a process of progression. We are in training, as we could say. Once we understand that, we would not automatically assume that our personal truth is the actual fundamental absolute truth of the universe on any particular subject. We would see that we have to discover new things in every area. That's what we would see. And it would only be through the experience of millions perhaps of people, just as it is on our physical life, that we would actually come to accept certain truths. So in our physical life, for example, we've come to accept the truth that we can fly because millions of people have done it every day, <laughs> safely. Yeah. Right? So we've now come to accept that there are these laws of aerodynamics that govern flight. And as a result, we now live by them and we accept them. All of us, have come, all of us who have ever flown have accepted them, whether we've understood them or not. We've actually come to accept the fundamental truth that flight is possible in a controlled manner. Now, this is where we need to go in all aspects of our life. We need to see 
that at some point our concept of the universe is going to need to change in order to accept absolute truth about whatever God knows is the absolute truth. Mm -hmm. And God knows the absolute truth about everything, everything that we could consider and think of, God already knows the truth about. And since that is the case, our personal truth is a fundamental flaw right from the beginning because we believe we are already God on that subject and that's physically impossible. Yeah. So yeah. I, feel, I feel that we need to give up this concept of this is my truth, mm -hmm. right? This is what I believe to be true is probably a far more um, accurate statement. This is what I believe to be true at this point is even more accurate. Yeah because it's actually at a point in time now yeah. that we're identifying. Tomorrow we might feel differently. Yes. Or we could say, at this point in time, this is my personal opinion, mm -hmm. because that's all it is. Mm -hmm. Once we discover divine truth, though, on a certain matter, we can always prove it scientifically. We can always prove it accurately. We can always support it with real evidence and experience. And so there are certain things in you and I life, for example, that we can state these are definitely fundamental, absolute truths about God and God's universe because we've experienced them. But when someone asks me a question about the future, I haven't experienced it yet. It's impossible for me to reply with any accuracy about the future. I might have feelings about the future. I might have opinions about the future, which if they're asking, I'm willing to share. But that doesn't mean they are God's truths because I have not experienced them yet. Yeah. It's, it, it's fundamentally flawed to assume that I can make a prophecy about the future and be accurate. To do that, I'd have to be God mm -hmm. and I'm certainly not God. Mm -hmm. And so this is an indication too of the problem with personal truth, personal opinion. It needs to be changed. And so we need to not hold on to it so strongly. So every time we have these personal opinions, we need to understand, this is just my personal opinion. If you can show me something different, I'd be happy to, <laughs> I'd be happy to listen to what you've got to say. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah. Okay, so then just to summarise everything that you said about personal truth then, mm -hmm. often it's an error from God's perspective. Yep. Um, and usually it's based on fear. If we don't have God's perspective, then we're usually in a state of fear. Well, fear is an automatic result of not knowing truth. It's like, it's like how do you feel when you're in a dark room in comparison to in a light room? If, if somebody told you there was in this dark room that you're in, there's all these possible things that could go wrong. Like this is the world we live in, actually. The world we live in, possibly, there's, a, there's huge amounts of things that could go wrong. And if we're in the dark about everything, they probably will. <laughs> it's like walking down a road in the dark with no torch and it's no moon, no light, no anything. You know, you're going to be doing this, aren't you, as you're walking along, feeling for things. If you're walking along when it's bright sunlight, you don't need to do that. So you're automatically in more fear when you're in darkness. Yes, yeah, yeah. sure. Okay, so error from God's perspective based in fear. Mm -hmm. um, and it usually begins because of something that we want to believe in. Mm. So we hold, this is our investment in well, holding more, on to it. It's more, a, emo, it's more about emotions for most of us. It's, we want to believe in certain things because we emotionally can't cope with an alternative. So, you know, and this is why some people believe in God, in fact. Some people believe in God because emotionally they can't cope with the alternative. That's not why I believe in God. No. But that's why some people believe in God. Some people don't believe in God because emotionally they can't cope with the alternative yes. as well. Yeah. Some people, you know, believe in all sorts of things. They believe that their wife loves them because they can't emotionally cope with the alternative. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And so a lot of the times we construct belief systems based around what we can cope with emotionally. Or what we think we can cope with emotionally. Exactly. It's not even what we can cope with emotionally. It's what we believe we can cope with emotionally, which is often also flawed. Yeah. Because <laughs> God created us to cope with far more emotionally than the average person copes with. So, so the, the sad thing is that almost all of our belief systems that are personal truths are about what we can cope with emotionally or what we hope emotionally. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> it's got nothing to do with reality or logic. <laughs> yeah. So can we talk then about <coughs> this idea that personal truth has an emotional signature? Mm. Because that's really what you're starting to talk about now. Mm. Um, what does that mean that it has an emotional signature? That it's something that it's painful to release if it's in error? Well, it it's might not be painful. Pleasurable. There might be pleasure associated with it as well, or okay. potential pleasure. If I believe a certain thing, I feel good. If I don't believe it, I feel bad, that kind of thinking. Uh -huh. Now, I suggest that these, uh, these are usually the underlying reasons why we have any faith in personal truth. It's because what we do is we say, I can cope emotionally with these kind of beliefs. I can't cope emotionally with these kind of beliefs. So I'm going to make out those beliefs are false yep. and make out those beliefs that I can cope with emotionally are true. Yeah. Right? So, so, for example, many Christians cannot cope emotionally with the belief that God will not come and destroy the wicked. Emotionally, they can't handle that concept even. They can't mm -hmm. handle the concept that God is going to allow wickedness for as long as it takes for mankind to realise that they can change. And most people who are Christian cannot cope with the concept that God will allow it. Mm -hmm. God is allowing it. We have proof. Very proof. Every day we have proof that God's allowing wickedness. Every moment we have proof. It's a fundamental proof. Opposite to many of the other beliefs, it's a fundamental thing we can actually prove through personal experience that God does allow wickedness. Mm -hmm. And yet, the average Christian cannot cope with that fundamental proof and so they hope differently. They create a belief that God is going to destroy the wicked and then they hope in that. Right? And they even sometimes revert to being God's tool of getting rid of the wicked. Yeah. In other words... Not God's real tool. Yeah. Yeah, not God's real tool, <laughs> but they believe themselves to be God's messenger of truth by destroying somebody who they believe is wicked. So there are many people historically who were Christian who have gone to war and murdered many thousands of people just because of what they believed was the truth because they couldn't cope with the fact that that wasn't true. And this is where I feel there is a huge emotional investment. This is the emotional signature, if you like, that is within people. There's huge emotional investments in believing certain things to be true that are not my own mother has the feeling, has the personal truth that you're a really bad guy because she can't face the reality that she's behaved badly and I've made a choice about that. Exactly. <laughs> so she's more confronted with that idea than just believing that you're a bad guy. Yeah, yeah. And people do this all the time. Yeah. People do this all the time. It is a fundamental problem with hum humanity at the moment in terms of our lack of logic. What we are constantly doing is we are throwing out what is often facing us right in the face, right? It's right there. We can see it. It's clear as day. But we throw it out because we can't emotionally cope with it. And so we or don't we believe it. we tell ourselves we can't emotionally cope with That's it. That's what I'm saying. Because God right? has a truth that the we truth, can. Yeah, the truth is that God created us to emotionally cope with everything. Mm. But we don't believe that, yeah. of course. We believe that the pain involved with coping with it is going to be too great for our ability to feel it. And so we choose to not feel it and instead create an alter reality. Mm. We create a life based on imagination. We imagine something to be true that's not. Mm -hmm. and, and this happens individually. It happens in relationships. It happens in society. It happens in nations, you know, and it happens in the world constantly. The wars of this world, particularly the wars we've observed in the last hundred years, have many times been caused by the imagination of people who don't want to face a different reality. Yeah. And it's very interesting how these things have occurred. And, you know, people who got into power, such as Hitler and Stalin and these kind of people, who eventually killed millions and millions of people through their own actions, many of them got into power because of the fears of people and what they could emotionally face. Both in, in Hitler's case in Germany and in England, you know, what they could emotionally face allowed a whole set of circumstances to occur that eventually resulted in a war mm -hmm. because they couldn't emotionally face certain things. The pain of the previous war, for example, for the German people. The, 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 the concept of, you know, if you take, you know, for the English people, the concept if you take away 
people's rights from them, sooner or later they rebel. And they, you know, they do all sorts of things when they rebel in harmony with their emotions, not in harmony with what's right. Yeah. And so we see that most of humanity's problems have actually been caused by not by knowing the truth, but rather by holding on to the emotional signatures of what we believe truth to be, that it's actually error. So holding on to personal truth that's in disharmony with love has exactly. actually created all of the pain and suffering. Exactly. Yeah. If all of us individually decided to bring our lives into harmony with absolute truth, there would be no war. There would be no pain and suffering. That's even if we decide to not bring our lives into harmony with love, mm -hmm. just truth, mm -hmm. there would be no war. Because we'd understand logically the truth that if I hurt you, then somebody who was hurt by me hurting you is probably going to want to hurt me. Yeah. That's logical. I don't even need to understand love to understand that. Yeah. Right? And yet we don't face that. Because we're so emotional, we just want to, we want to uh, exercise, our, exorcise our pain by harming someone that you've, you know, that, that's attached to your uh, life because you have harmed me. Mm. Like, so what drove us? Not logic. What's driven us is our own emotional signature of pain and suffering that we're avoiding and therefore our personal truth drove us. Now, I wouldn't call that God's truth because if, if we were in harmony with God's truth, we'd see the absolute truth that if I harm your family or you, someone in your family probably is going to feel at least like harming me mm. or someone in my family. Surely that's going to happen. Now, if we do that on a national basis, if, you're, you, know, if you happen to be Iraq and I happen to be USA, <laughs> you know, yeah. if I decide to harm you, Iraq, then someone in Iraq is going to want to finish up harming me, USA. Yeah. It makes total logical sense, and yet very few people understand it from a logical perspective or truth-based perspective, let alone an emotional one. And so this is where I see that if we understood truth better, even if we hadn't come to love yet, we, this world that we lived in would be completely different. Yeah. 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 Okay, great. And can I also say that the average person who believes in this whole concept of personal truth is fully willing to justify their own poor behaviour towards others because they don't see it from God's truth's perspective. Mm. So I see this whole concept of personal truth as a very damaging concept on the planet in the sense that it causes huge amounts of pain and suffering because each person is in a different set of personal truths which are not truths at all, but rather just opinions based upon their own emotional suffering. Yeah, very true. Yeah.